Yeah, so welcome on Ari. I'm so happy to have you here. What led you to becoming a performance therapist who specializes in holistic and medical healing arts? Yeah, so, you know, at the beginning of my career, I was really blessed. We had amazing trainers, amazing uh, teachers, and uh, the owner of our school had been a therapist for 40 years. So she had basically known everybody in the industry and would fly them out to come work with us and train us. And so within like the first six months of being in that school, we did a, an event at a health fair. And I ended up working on a couple of um, professional sports players. And that led to them bringing me onto the court that night, basically saying, you're amazing, come hang out with us. So I ended up on the court that night and I didn't leave for a year. Um, I was basically brought in as a, uh, an intern. And um, what was really awesome about that is I got to learn from all of the trainers and therapists and the array of entourage that a professional athlete has. And so I got to learn all of these different skill sets from all of these different amazing practitioners. And I started working with pro athletes. And what I found was that they were getting much better performance than they were getting out of other kinds of modalities or therapies. And so when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, the, the massage boards were non-existent. It was, everything was run by vice uh, through the adult entertainment industry. And it was basically a criminal background check, STD test and fingerprint, and you're good to get a license. And I was not about to sign my name off to something like that. So I had to think of what, what would I be called? And a lot of my clients who were professional or Olympic athletes basically said, well, I help, you know, that I help them with their performance, that I increase their performance, that their performance gets better. And so performance therapist was, was born. That was about 24 years ago or so. And uh, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are starting to use that title, <laughs> but I, I, I like to tell people I'm the original. So <laughs> Love that, love that. And how does that compare to something like, say, a sports psychology or sports therapy or exercise therapy in the sense yes. of psychology? So if you take if you take um, massage therapy, chiropractic, hypnotherapy, um, mental game, energy work, gymnastics, and martial arts, and you like put them all into a bucket, and and then you add on that a lot of training. That's me. Okay. So I grew up. Uh, Playing, doing gymnastics, playing baseball, uh, playing tennis, long distance cycling, martial arts. I was always an athlete growing up, getting injured myself mm -hmm. and <clears throat> had some medical issues like a brain tumor that was messing with my health. And so I was just really fascinated by why medicine in general wasn't able to fix me and what I could do. And so I, I started studying these array of modalities. And so, you know, I tell people like you could go to a sports psychologist, a sports therapist, a personal trainer, an athletic trainer, a, you know, <laughs> chiropractor, right. you could go to all those people, or you could just go to me and, um, and we can get all of those things done. So part of my, my training was clinical hypnotherapy and with an emphasis in sports hypnotherapy. Um, and then I have a lot of functional medicine training as well. So I work with the nutrition, the, you know, getting all of their inflammation and inflammatory markers down. Yep, yep, you know, yep. you got to work on an athlete, an athlete who who's going for a gold medal or a world championship has a different set of, of criteria and needs than the, the average person, because what happens to them in a 10th of a second is not only recognizable, they can feel it in their bodies. That 10th of a second is, is, is minutia to somebody that, is, uh, you know, not an athlete, they wouldn't notice if they were two or three or four minutes late, let alone tens of seconds. And so when, when you have that, you learn how to deal with all of those aspects of the minutia, because if you could do one little tweak, 
that takes tenths of seconds off of the time, you, you, you're turning somebody from third place into first place. And, um, and that's just way too major of a, of a deal for them <laughs> to not, you know, want to train myself to be the best I could be for them. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's amazing how you're really taking all of those quality or not qualities, but modalities. I sometimes question why there aren't more people who do that because being who I am, I've sometimes wanted to be like, yeah, I want to have all of those different modalities under my belt so that I can help people more wholly than just being like, oh, here's my scope. I know about this, but I can't actually help you in it. Um, right. Yeah. So scope of practice versus scope of training. This is an, a question that when I used to teach ethics, I would ask all the time. Because if you think about it, scope of practice is kind of an arbitrary decision designed by a body of association of people who are doing an average of things, right? And so as soon as you move outside of that average and you become extraordinary, you're no longer fitting into their puzzle, into their box. Yeah, you've created a jigsaw puzzle all of your own. And so the, the scope of law, the scope of practice, as, as it said, is kind of akin to standards of practice. And the standards of practice, if you look at medicine right now, what are they? You go to a doctor, you're in the doctor's office, maybe five to seven minutes, and they're required by the insurance companies through the standards of care to either pro provide you with a prescription or a procedure. If they don't do one of those two things, after a number of sessions, then they can be investigated and shut down by the AMA, by um, the, the regulating bodies, right? These are, these are not for the customer benefit, for the patient benefit. These are for the regulate, regulatory body benefit. So that they can make more money on, on their stuff. So I, I used to ask that question, scope of practice versus scope of training. If I'm trained in functional medicine and your doctor is not, for instance, and I'm reading your blood and stool and diagnostics and your doctor's reading them, he's going to read them via a pathological reading system versus I'll read them via a functional mm -hmm. reading system, right? So the difference between the two is one looks at the average of what is going to be sick. So if you're already showing markers of sick, you're like well beyond what those marker, your, your past symptom, you're, you know, you're into danger zone. Mm -hmm. If So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, functional medicine, they would say that a, a good testosterone amount is six to 800. That's like a really functional amount. You're not getting into rage. You're not getting into issues because you're too high and you're not having libido issues and energy issues because you're too low. However, the pathological numbers are 200 to 1100. Huge range. That it's a huge range, but if you're two to four or 500, you're not having recovery for your muscles. You're not having energy. You're not having a libido. You could be experiencing erectile dysfunction. You could be experiencing all kinds of issues if you're too low. If you're in that two to 600 range, it could be a problem for you. You could be experiencing massive symptoms, but they won't tell you that anything's wrong because you're within the average. Mm -hmm. But if the average, I mean, think about it this way. This is for the audience. Is 95% of the people that you see in front of you healthy? Because if they're not, then you may want to look at going to somebody who's a functional medicine person versus a pathological, normal, allopathic doctor. And the only reason is, is because there's a bell curve in the blood tests. And the curve is based on if 95% of the population is healthy, then these are the average numbers. But we know that we have a very unhealthy population, and those numbers are not based on optimal or healthy ranges. They're based on average ranges. So what's normal okay. does not mean it's healthy. Absolutely. I mean, I know personally I've had that argument with practitioners in the past, and 
currently I'm seeing uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon because she's going to be looking at it from a much more holistic perspective. And yeah, Gabrielle's awesome. Yeah. And it was one of those that I was like, I could look for someone more local, but for me, knowing what I want, knowing how my body functions best. I live in an area where a lot of people push plant-based and I know that it doesn't work well for me. I knew she wasn't going to push it. Right. <laughs> and actually my blood test showed that I should not be plant-based for many, many reasons. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I heard a great saying recently, and the saying is, if you want to detoxify and clean out your body, you go plant, and then you want to heal and recover from all of that detoxification, then you start eating the meat because meat yeah. heals, plants detoxify. So yes, it's an awesome thing to detoxify your system. But once you do that, are you typically energetic when you're in the middle of a detox? Are you typically yeah. feeling your best? Are you, you know, no. So once you're cleaned out, once you've given your organs that, that time to heal, now all of a sudden you can start eating the meat and get, get the iron, get all of the nutrients. Because remember, even the dinosaurs knew this, or the paleontologists, is you eat, whatever you eat is what whatever you ate, ate. So if you're eating a cow, you're getting all the things that the cow ate. So if you're eating a cow that's eating grains, you're eating grains. Uh, hormones, antibiotics, you're eating hormones and antibiotics. Mm -hmm. If you're eating grass fed, that's free range, that's out in the plains, that's eating very mineral rich grass, all of a sudden you're getting all those minerals that are in the food that they're eating. So just kind of a reminder to people because there's a lot of hype and fad and, you know, fad diets that are around and everybody has an opinion and, you know, like an asshole, everybody's opinion pretty much stinks. You know, science kind of rocks. I, I like science. And when you get down to the nitty gritty of science, you go, okay, you know, this is, this is where truth meets fiction, you know, <laughs> perception and reality get skewed. And, you know, I get the sustainability issues of being a vegan or plant-based person, but the way that we've gone about it, engineering food to become plant-based is making the food extremely unhealthy. Absolutely. It's definitely taken over in some areas. Yeah. Sorry about this. My video seems to have disappeared. And then you said you use obviously a whole body approach. So when you begin working with an individual, where do you really focus in on when you start that whole evaluation? Yeah. So evaluation protocols are, are probably the most important thing because I'll spend two to three hours with somebody. And I will ask them about their family history. I'll ask them about their current history, their lifestyle, uh, the foods that they're eating, what they want to accomplish, what they've done in the past, what injuries they've had. I mean, I basically, the way that I look at it is doctors of the past used to actually show up at your door and live with you for a week or two weeks or three weeks and learn how you lived before they would diagnose you and start prescribing fixes for whatever ailed you. And we've moved away from that with these seven minute, <laughs> yeah, you know, seven minute appointments that, you know, it takes an hour in the waiting room to get to. And, you know, how is a doctor truly supposed to know what's wrong with you in a seven minute session? It's not possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's simply not possible. You can prescribe all the tests. You can, you know, get all the, the diagnosis tests, which you're not allowed to do either because you can only go, if there's a marker for something, then you can do the extended tests. But wouldn't it be like the best thing? This is what I do. The best thing to do all of the tests up front, get all of the information up front, and then develop a plan of action that follows a, a you know like a scientific approach that's kind of like where we can check and double check and recheck and you know make progress reports and we have really clear understanding of what is going on that's different and changing in the person so we can evaluate I mean this this is the approach of a functional medicine of a lifestyle medicine person but I have that added benefit of 
being really knowledgeable in the physical body. So if somebody's injured, how is that stopping them from exercising and moving? How is that stopping their mental ability from wanting to get up and do something if they're worried about getting re-injured? You know, these are kind of things that, that you've got to look at every aspect of somebody's life so that you can do the best thing for them. And, you know, a lot of people have told me, well, that's just a lot of work. I'm like, yeah, but why did you get into this job business? I mean, it's not like this is going to be your $100 million business being a personal trainer, to, mm-hmm. you know, or a, or a therapist. It's going to make you money if you're good, but it's not, you know, one of, it's not like you have that ability to just, boom, I've got, a, you know, a mass amount of money coming in, right? Absolutely. So you got into the business in order to help people heal. And so why not actually do that? Why not stop the madness and the things that make no sense and start treating people with high performance so that you're constantly increasing their optimized ability? So anyway, that's my my spiel, my lecture, my rant. <laughs> it's all good. That's basically what my book is about, but I'm trying to poke college students with it. Like, why wouldn't you want to fix your health now? But also I am currently getting a master's in public health, but it's so often that they're like, yep, just go see the doctor. And if people went to see the doctor more often, they'd get help. And it's like, yes, but if the doctor's not, fi- my argument always against anything is if the doctor's not finding the root cause, we're stuck still in that cycle of health problems. Which is why I think that we need more people like me, frankly, who uh, learn a lot of different modalities, because even if you don't practice them, at least you know who to partner with and play with and refer to. Um, You know, so medicine in general needs to integrate. We hear this buzzword a lot, integrative medicine, integrative this, integrative practice, So I'll give you a story. I was consulting a a place, it's on a university campus and it's a integrated medical center that is literally in the campus right below the stadium where everybody is performing. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't get the athletes to go downstairs and come into their office. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why is that? You're integrated, right? So I asked the question, how often do you guys have a meeting to discuss patients together as a unit? Never. Um, how often do you work with a client in a setting where it's like that client is the center of attention and you're using all of the modal? Never. Okay, so you pretty much don't have an integrative practice. You just have a practice that has a lot of things in it. Yeah. Okay. So maybe if you started talking to each other, you might get better results. Like just as an example, like that would be the first thing. Start talking to each other about the people coming in and what you're doing and how the other practitioners might be able to be an adjunctive supportive help for them. Oh, oh, you mean we can talk to each other? It's like, (laughs) you know, like, we don't speak the same language. We speak a language of health. They speak a language of sick. We speak a language of muscle. They speak a language of bone and nerve. You know, it's like each mm-hmm. modality has a completely different language. And if you don't at least learn the language, how are you going to ever know what you're doing and how are you going to ever honor and respect the other professions, right? That's the other thing is, you know, you look at like massage, for example, it's one of the lowliest uh, considered professions in medicine. And I have a a story that I wrote about that that basically goes, okay, if you had the worst massage in the world, just a a relaxation, music, nothing, you know, fixing, just circulation, Mm -hmm. effleurage massage, what's happening in your body? Well, your vagus nerve is getting relaxed. Your central nervous system is calming down. You're leaving fight or flight. You're balancing out into a more of a sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system response. So 
your adrenals are going to calm down, your cortisol is going to lower, your human growth hormone is going to go up, you're going to have the ability to recover from stress and injury and illness better, you're going to have more energy, you're going to, okay, wait, just by doing that, okay, yeah, that's just one, and then if you also just say you're increasing circulation in the bloodstream and moving tissue, so you're helping to detoxify the body, oxygenate the blood, give nutrients to the organs and cells, what else in the world that you can do for one hour <laughs> laying there doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Is going to give you as much health benefit as that one thing. Now extrapolate that out, right? To all of the other aspects of what benefit that has. So why is this a profession that is considered to be the hookers of the health field? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and why is it that the profession itself hasn't stepped up to stop that kind of bullying loudly from the other health professions and this is where i i get into my you know my stuff because i i'm so passionate about the results that we get and i see in the last 26 years of my career how crappy the results are that are being delivered and how they just get crappier and crappier. And it's like, you just have to go more. You just have to go more. You just have to do more procedures. Okay, but what about the result that I'm trying to get from the procedure, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I get, I get passionate because I want, I want the patients, I want the clients, I want the audience that's listening to have advocacy and to be able to step up and stand up for themselves and say to the doctors, I need more from you. I need to get better. You need to help me get better. And if you need to learn more so that you can help me get better, then you need to do your job and do that. And if you had 20 patients telling you that on a regular basis, maybe you do something different, right? Absolutely. So we have to take personal responsibility for as practitioners and then personal responsibility as consumers mm -hmm. to get the best care, to demand the best care, to stop the silence or to stop the bully. You have to end the silence. You have to get loud. Absolutely. I was talking with um, a peer last week and she was saying how her general practitioner has been preaching the eggs cause cholesterol problem for ages. And she being who she is, being in the functional medicine space, knowing it's not true, would be like, yeah, no. And her like levels were fine, but every time she'd go to see him, she'd bring him a gift of another research article proving against it. <laughs> and he has finally stopped preaching it to other patients. So she's like, we're getting there slowly, little that, things. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, I, you know, World Health Organization, and I think it was 1991, could be 2001, I don't remember exactly, mm -hmm. basically, had a correlation study between women and heart disease and cholesterol issues and found absolutely zero correlation between heart disease and cholesterol. Zero. Mm -hmm. Number one prescribed medication worldwide. Statin is cholesterol medication, Lipitor. Number one worldwide. Zero correlation between it and heart disease. Not only that, you look at things like cholesterol, right? What is your brain built about? Fat and cholesterol. Yeah. So if you cut fat and cholesterol, are you going to be able to think clearly, cognitively, yeah. common sense? No, you're going to be reactive to emotional ties more than to logic because yeah. your brain is starving for its food. And it's the thing that makes it up is the cholesterol and fat. So yeah, we okay. have completely destroyed you know, natural, <laughs> natural uh, processes of eating, natural processes of, uh, of all of that. Yeah, definitely. I was actually, I used an article on possible benefits of ketosis for old people and reestablishing re some more difficult mental functions that they tend to lose with aging. And so it was just one of those, I'm like, we could improve our focus and function. And because then I applied it to children learning. Yeah, you know, it's funny for your book, it would be great to to have that as an included thing because 
you know, kids these days, especially in school, are seeking anything to increase and enhance their performance in in school. So they're drugging it up. I mean, with Adderall. you know, Adderall, Ritalin, cocaine. Mm-hmm. I mean, like whatever they could get their hands on, really, Absolutely. is what they're drugging to in order to study longer, deeper. Well, guess what? If you eat more healthy foods and fats, you're going to have better brain function and think clearer and have more cognition and have more memory and comprehension. Mm. There was a, a, a movie, uh, Broken Brains. Did you see that series? I did not. It's with Dr. Mark Hyman. And they, it's an eight part series. They go through all the brain function, but they're, they're calling Alzheimer's type three diabetes. I have heard that one. And the reason why they're calling it that is because it's an inflammatory disorder that is based on sugar and inflammation in your body, breaking the blood brain barrier, going to your brain, causing your body and your brain to create a plaque or cholesterol which by the way, is there to heal and ease the inflammation. So it's, it's the healing mechanism, not the, not the hurting mechanism, but they're using, uh, they're, they're basically finding that that cholesterol covering causing plaque over those inflamed areas is what is causing dementia and Alzheimer's. And so as soon as they start cutting that insulin response and put people on an AIP diet, which is anti-inflammatory autoimmune diet, all of a sudden you're eliminating all of the things that cause that inflammation and brain function starts coming back almost immediately, like readily within a month or two, you'll, you'll, you'll start seeing your family member increased their memory and cognition and et cetera. It's, it's quite amazing, actually. Oh, it is fascinating. I, I love, I'll have to check that one out. I am always either learning about that or my other favorite thing is to learn about infectious disease. Don't ask. It's just one of those weird, like, things I got really interested in probably like when I was 10 and have continued to read on since then. All of Richard Preston's stuff has been consumed multiple times, you name it, everything else. But <laughs> it's an interesting, get, yeah, it's an interesting I get to the project. It's used either on Ebola or the Spanish flu <laughs> or, that, or nutrition and how it impacts our health. Now you have a new one, but, but let me ask you a question based on what you know, right? Because I'll, I'll hear stories of things like viruses aren't real. They're actually just exosomes. And scientifically, that could be explained pretty well. Um, they're not alive, right? Mm-hmm. So they can't like jump on you. <laughs> they have to be placed or picked up. Um, and really all they do, all they are is a dead protein that, that makes your body fight itself. So I haven't heard a whole lot of talk on how to raise your immune system this last year. Um, what do you think has been missing from the conversation? I'm sorry, I went into interview mode for a second. <laughs> no, what do you think good. is what do you, what do you think is the <laughs> the missing information that the this the space between what they're saying in the media and in the news? What we've been missing this last year with regards to taking care of this infectious disease? I mean, from what the people I look at for resources, as well as just what I'm seeing and what's being promoted in the media, because I also sometimes watch. TV shows that have been portraying COVID actually. And um, truly what I've been seeing is there's a lot of push on it's bad, it's scary, which don't get me wrong, anything that's new should be feared to an extent, but they're not um, talking about how we can lessen our chance of getting it by getting metabolically healthy, improving our immune system, lowering our inflammatory systemic inflammation. they haven't been promoting things like eating well and how to eat in a way that's not inflammatory or exercising to just benefit us and boost the immune system. And yeah, I think it's a problem where I've been seeing, I know um, Dr. Paul Saladino gets censored all the time on social media and he is always promoting how to improve our immune system so that this stuff doesn't happen. And it's disheartening being in this field when not that social media should be maybe our main form of communication, but it is a big option to promote and benefit others that it's 
being blocked. Yeah, I find the censorship in general in life to be ridiculous, you know? I don't, I'm not a politically correct person. I don't think any human being is actually politically correct, except mm -hmm. for their own belief system, which is not politically correct to be only for your belief system. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of any of that. I think it causes more stress and illness mm -hmm. to, um, to not express. And frankly, I think all of the things that people say that are extremely distasteful, it's good to hear them. Because if it makes you cringe, you, you know that you have some kind of inner morality that <laughs> is cringing. You know, if it affects you, it's like, good, that affected me. I'm not going to do that to somebody else because that affected me. Not tell other people how to do their thing, but watch what happens when people expose themselves for who they are. Oh, absolutely. Either they have to shift or they get isolated somewhere else, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and I think with this year, just being in a way so isolated from others, so many have turned to say social media and just being who I am, I running was and will be forever my first true love. I know it's maybe not always the best training modality and that strength and everything needs to be in there as well to be really good and healthy. So often though, I see the blind leading the blind on Facebook running groups on how to do X, Y, and Z. And when I try to help, I usually get blocked from a group. <laughs> and so yeah. it can be so disheartening. And then I'm like, okay, I will never treat someone that way. But I've seen how they don't like to hear new information. Yeah, it's funny. I, I the Like any of the professional groups these days, it's really difficult to participate because all of the beliefs are so solidified. Mm -hmm. It's like, there's no room or discussion, possibility, shifting a perception, thought pattern. It's like, what I believe is what's true. Nobody's going to shift that. I remember uh, somebody posted a, a meme on his site, uh, and it was something about avocado toast being more calories than, um, than Nutella. And I said, it's not the calories that is... Yeah the problem. It's the quality of ingredients that cause an effect on your organ system that has nothing to do with a caloric effect. Mm -hmm. And that's way, way worse. So, you know, why don't you still eat the avocado, not worry about the ex extra calories because they're good calories that are healthy for you. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you want the Nutella, just make it yourself with some cacao and monk fruit and, you know, hazelnuts and, Absolutely. you know, you could even do raw sprouted hazelnuts if you wanted to and make it live yeah. with enzymes. I mean, do it yourself. You don't have to avoid the foods that you love. You could just make them a little bit differently so that they're healthy for you. And, you know, this is something so easy. And I actually got uh, cancel cultured. I got banned from his page for, for, and I, I was very polite. I just said, this is my thought on it. Yep. Uh, you know, I appreciate your thought. Here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and yeah, I got banned from, from the page for okay. doing that. I'm like, okay. You know, if, if you're so threatened that your belief is wrong by somebody offering a, a different opinion that you have to like shut them down and delete the comments so nobody else can see it you're pretty insecure in your ability to do your job because you could say anything. I could defend my position mm -hmm. in any which way, you know, I could have a good quality debate about the nutritive value of food, you know, <laughs> like, but if you cancel, then you're saying that you're weak. And, and my, here's my opinion. Yeah. If you cancel somebody, you're saying I'm too weak. I can't handle somebody thinking differently than I do. So I need to avoid, leave, dismiss, isolate, whatever, push them away so that I'm not uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. Often at minus there, people are like, I'm trying to lose weight running. And I'm like, there the results or the suggestions of people is more calorie deficit and run more. And I'm like, both of those are going to continually rev you down in your metabolism. You're not going to get anywhere. Um, and so,
Someone left the house phone down here. <laughs> no problem. Um, love that. Um, but yeah, no, and I'm, I love how you're saying because people cannot take when someone's against what they're saying or I don't often like you believe in necessarily calories in calories out. I'm like, what are you actually eating? Is it full of nutrients? I mean, I even had my own adventure with it this week. Um, I don't like to eat protein bars for the fact that they have so much crap in them, but sometimes I am on the go and I know that I cannot keep a steak in the car for 10 hours without refrigeration. My body will not be able to take the food poisoning. <laughs> um, so I sometimes do like to have something that I don't need refrigeration on, but I was like, they're full of crap. I created my own protein fat bomb thing this week using plain whey a little bit of cocoa powder, um, some coconut butter and some coconut flakes, basically. Nice. Yeah. There are solutions out there that are easy, inexpensive, mm -hmm. you know, don't take a whole lot. But, you know, I tell people you want to shop, obviously, in the outskirts of the store, not in the middle. You want as, as little of pre-processed foods as you could possibly um, deal with and make your own food, you know, take a day on a Sunday to do it. And, you know, I mean, make your own, make your own food, Absolutely. do your own thing, be your own person, right? Yeah. Sustain yourself. This is what, you know, we hear a lot in, in the media, people are, are yelling and screaming about what, having been controlled by the world and the systems. Well, do something about it. Start with yourself right? Mm -hmm. Instead of complaining about what the government's doing or not doing, complain about what you're doing or not doing to yourself in a mirror, <laughs> you know, um, and, and then figure out what's important to me. What's the thing that is going to be so important to me that, that I'm willing to talk about it on social media and complain? Because if you're willing to talk about it on social media and complain, you should be willing to do some actions and take some steps to actually do and fix and replace and change the thing that's upsetting you the most. Oh, right? Right. That's what create a new tomorrow is about is creating a new tomorrow today. We made this shit up, all of it, everything, money, buildings, shelter. We made it all up. It came out of our heads. We could do better. And it wasn't even our heads. It was somebody else's that hundreds of years ago. So we're just married to this construction of figment, you know, this <laughs> figment of our imagination. We're so married to that we'd be willing to sacrifice human life for money that we made. You know, we're willing to sacrifice human life and value money over that. That's our healthcare system. Yeah. Right. I mean, let's just let's just really go. We made money up. Humans made money up. Without humans, there is no money. But we'll kill humans in order to get money that we made up. Absolutely. This it doesn't is. make sense to me. This is a fundamental flaw in our thinking as a society and as a civilization. And we really need to shift it, but we need people to say, this is fucked up. This is wrong. This isn't correct. We made it up. Let's do better. And that's, that's kind of where, where I'm at these days. After 26 years in my career, watching people, you know, come to me after going to 30 other practitioners and not getting better mm -hmm. and coming to me and I go, okay, well, they didn't do this, this, and this, and that would have taken five minutes and then you would have been better. I want people to be of high quality. I want to come back to a place where we as a society appreciate and value each other, human beings, but also mastery, mm -hmm. mastery of a skill set, mastery of your job. If you were a master shoe smith, would you let any of the sh shoes going out in the market today go out? No, because they're going to break in a year. You know that. So as a master, you wouldn't allow a product that you put out to do that. As a therapist, if I didn't get a result for an athlete who was going from an injury to a gold medal, 
and had six months to get to a place where he could compete for the competition for that prize, if I didn't get results, I wouldn't have a job. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have 26 years, you know? So how is it that all of these doctors that are getting no good results and it's not their fault, it's literally the system's fault that they're being bullied by. But if I was a doctor and I was being bullied for more than five years, I probably would take it for the first five as I was learning. But after that, I'm going to learn something that, that what I'm doing is not being the most effective. I'm going to shift and change it. I'm going to go up against that system that I see not working. So challenge to all the doctors out there, challenge to all the practitioners and therapists and trainers that are pissed off with your associations, that are pissed off with the laws that are not, that you're seeing what you're trained to do is not getting done and your results are showing for that, get up, stand up, get loud, start getting media, put it out there. People deserve to get healthy. And if you're going to be in the profession, then you're obligated in my life, in my, in my rant, <laughs> you're obligated if you're going to be in this profession to make them healthy, to get them to a place where they could be healthy, where they could control health not sick. Absolutely. So that's my rant. And I do a lot of those. I'm I sorry. get that. There's a uh, reason I do what I do. And I left pharmacy school halfway through because while I probably could have finished and then done something about it, I also looked at being a new pharmacist. What would have been my options? I would have been supposed to be working at CVS because how else am I going to pay off all those lovely loans? And for me, I was like, I cannot be continuing the cycle of giving someone 15 maintenance medications at the same time as them buying their cigarettes with their inhalers and their giant bottles of soda with their insulin. And it, I saw it day in and day out and being an intern and working in that space, I wasn't allowed to say a thing because it was a big chain. I probably shouldn't even mentioned what I, where I worked, but they were all the same way. Um, and it bothered me having health coaching certifications, having, a personal training certification at that point to be unable to prescribe other options and other alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it can become very frustrating. You know, when I was 18 and I started uh, in school, my teacher said, everybody needs to become a minister. And so we all did universal life church ministry. Uh, I've done a lot of weddings now and, and stuff like that, which is kind of cool. But um, we did that originally because he said, we need to avoid the laws and we can avoid the laws because they can't regulate lay on of the hands healing from a minister if that's what you do. And so, you know, it's funny because I've never used that aspect of, mm -hmm. of the ministry, but I know a lot of functional medicine doctors that have moved away from calling themselves doctor. They've moved away from their licenses and they're starting to practice functional medicine as consultants mm -hmm. and getting their protection through a pastoral medical association It's called PMA. And who, they have a ton of lawyers that have never lost a case. It's an ecclesiastic organization for medicine. And, um, and a lot of doctors I, I've heard and I've seen are moving towards that so that they can actually do the work that they know is the right work to do that the regulating bodies have basically put a kibosh on. Um, I had a friend who is a gynecologist in Orlando and she was learning functional medicine, stopped prescribing uh, procedures and pills to every client and ended up getting investigated for over a year, had to shut down her practice completely. I mean, they, they ruined her because she wasn't practicing in that standard of care. And the standard of care wasn't getting her patients healthy, but what she was doing was. So there's where that dichotomy, that thing that is like, we want the fix to be a pill, but it's not. 
Mm -hmm. So how do we get to a reality where we can actually say the cure is not in the pill? It's in all of these other aspects of your life. The pill is a symptom regulator, not a cause regulator. So, you know, we need to move into a place where we as a people can go. The quick fix is to be healthy all the time. The quick fix is to maintain health. The quick fix is to prevent disease. The quick fix is to eat fast food, which is grabbing an apple off of a tree. That's the fastest food, you know, like there are such quick, cheap, easy fixes that if they got explored and then implemented would be so much fun because it would, people would go, oh, wait, I could like walk down the street to my local park. And instead of 15 oak trees, we got an apple tree, an orange tree, maybe a little berry bushes or something like that. And we can eat, you know, a lunch and fast food while, while we're taking a break. Maybe our, our, you know, corporate offices have a garden on the roof that is growing hydroponic food for all of the employees to eat instead of having vending machines with Snickers bars. You know, like these are things that they, they wouldn't cost as much as some of the current solutions to life cost like, Snickers bars and Coca-Cola, right? It would, it would cost less. Why? Because we could grow it. Mm -hmm. It's right there. We can squeeze that lemon into our water and have flavored water. We don't have to have soda. Like, <laughs> you yeah, know, we yeah. don't have to do the things that are bad for us anymore just because we've done them a lot. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I love that point of the fast food being like fruit on a tree. My one job this summer, I could walk outside and I would go pick grapes off the vines. Um, and I had to share them with everyone else, but I could go get them. Um, and again, very much your point, if I wanted that and I didn't bring enough food for myself for a meal, I at least had that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I had a thing I wanted to do once. I wanted to do a national throw seeds on the freeway day and like, off the freeway, if you're just driving down the road onto the medians and onto the, uh, the sides, just like throw seeds and see what happens. Let's see if in a year we have berries and trees and fruit and stuff growing on the on the freeway for people if they're driving down the road, truckers, you know, going down the road. And instead of stopping at the gas stop for fried food, they could just stop off the side of the road, grab a few, you know, yeah, yeah. the fruit. I mean, we have a we have a big market for this. <laughs> May yeah. not make us money, but it'll make us healthy and it'll save a lot of money in healthcare costs. Oh, absolutely. Another one of the things I'm always poking at in my public health program, if we actually were healthy, we wouldn't be spending as much money on healthcare. <laughs> exactly. I think it's like become the number one GDP is healthcare. I think so. Number one expense on our sheets. Like none of that has to be the case. We have enough technology, we have enough knowledge, we have enough science that we never have to experience things like scurvy again or nutritional you know, deficiencies and things like that due to not having quality food. So what did we do instead is we created a chemical industry to poison our food and cause chronic disease versus acute conditional disease based on a, you know, nutritional deficiency or something immediate. So yeah, we have the technology. We could, we could literally shift the things that we're doing within a year and create tremendously different outcomes. If we had the courage as a people to shut up and stop complaining and start doing the things that we know to do, like growing food in our backyards and, you know, creating the gardens in our businesses and in schools. Like I went to FIT because they were putting uh, Florida Institute of Technology. They were putting like a Taco Bell in their commissary. And I'm like, look, you have enough land and you have a science department. We could create hydroponic gardens 
that will feed your entire school plus the community at large. And you have free labor, labor in the students who will be learning about hydroponics, aeroponics, nutritive, you know, <laughs> nutrition. Yeah. I mean, like, where are the schools doing that? Where are the, the scientific studies on whole plant supplements like herbs and things like that, right? There's, there's not a lot. They're all isolated studies of chemicals versus mm -hmm. full spectrum. When we start doing those, now we can start saying, hey, we can make this herb, you know, so that it's as effective as the pill without the side effects and consistent. That's the problem right now is the consistency of quality and supplement market. But if we can get the science behind it and the studies on the actual plants that go into the drugs, not the extracts that go into the drugs, because all the drugs on the market, you, you learned this in pharmaceutical school, oh, yeah. most of them come from the Amazon, the rainforest, the herbs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> The, the pill that they had me on for, um, for the brain tumor is the same fungus that they make LSD out of. I mean, the things that we could find to cure people if we could study it and not isolate out, but full spectrum and study where the cofactors, where, do, where does, okay, so we know like CBD is really good, but where are the cofactors that make it if you just isolate out that CBD. The enzymes, the other parts of the plant that make that plant function in your body efficiently and fully, right? So we just, we have more work to do, but. Oh, absolutely. But it's so doable. It's so easy mm -hmm. to do. The only obstacle is the ego of this construct that we believe in so much that we've created out of our imaginations. Absolutely. There actually was a company I saw um, the other day who was working towards this in a way. They have, um, I think they were called Vessel. I'm actually going to try to contact them and see if I can get them on the show or one of their um, founders or something, but they have it. It's literally you pee on it. You let it develop for, I don't know how long I didn't read all of it. And then you literally scan it with their app on your phone. Uh, like the results tab, which is like a different color code chart thing that pops up from your um, P test. And it actually will tell you what you're deficient in from what things you can get from urine tests. And it then suggests what things you should be eating, could be eating more of to get those things. And I'm like, it's not the whole picture, but it's definitely a start and it's being designed so that people can be doing it in their homes. Nice. Yeah. I mean, anything that people could do to get the testing done. I, I find it unconscionable that they tell people that they can't do tests until other tests are done. Mm -hmm. Like, like an x-ray and you have to have an x-ray before you can get an MRI. They tell you completely different information. One deals with bone, one deals with soft tissue. There's totally different information. And you're not going to see a tear in an x-ray. You're going to see a tear in an MRI. You're going to see a crack in the bone in an x-ray. You're, you know, like they're different. Why do you need to do one before the other? Oh, because you get to charge money and get paid for it. That makes no sense. You're still spend. it's like still a fraudulent thing. Absolutely. I mean, my sister's had a number of MRIs for a health issue and finally they're going to an MRA because it could possibly be a blood vessel that is causing the problem, but they're just after two years. Right. Got it. Yeah. So anyway, I, I hope that this is being helpful. I think I just went off on Absolutely. many, many tangents with you, but I, 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 <laughs> I'm so used to, to being the interviewer that, uh, <laughs> that I kind of absconded. So I'll let you, you know, do your thing and ask away. Yeah, no, but honestly, with the handful of questions I had drawn up ahead of time, which is just really what I use to get myself organized for an interview, um, you honestly have answered them in your tangents. So it truly doesn't matter in my opinion. And I think it's been great because you're very much applying so many of them or giving examples, which for me are valuable because I'm a person who needs examples. 
I'm the person who I'm like, if you show me what that looks like, then I can perform it or I can apply it to my own life. Where if you're just talking about it, it goes right up and over my head. <laughs> gotcha. AK, you're an AK person, audio kinesthetic. Yep. And NLP. Absolutely. Yeah, so we've obviously talked, some of my questions were like taking that proactive mindset with medicine instead of an emergency mindset. What are the benefits of that? You've obviously talked about that a lot in us. Yeah, so, so overall, if, if you're looking back on your life at 90 years old and you want to know when you should have spent your money and when you should not spend your money. So when you're young, you should spend your money. When you're older, you should not spend your money, right? But our healthcare system is designed so that when you're young, you think you're invincible and you just, you know, completely trash your health. And then by the time you get older, you now have to spend massive amounts of money to regain health that you could have had all the time. Mm -hmm. So spend your money now. Don't say, well, if I could afford the organic, then I'd eat it. Or if I could afford the massage, or if I could afford the trainer, if I could afford to get healthy, I, I would. No, uh-uh. You can't afford not to. 49% of all businesses fail because of health issues. 49% of bankruptcies are because of medical bills. So you cannot afford to use that mindset that prevention is too expensive right now. I'll just react when I get sick. You can't afford that. And especially nowadays with all this stuff going on in healthcare, in the world, in the pandemic, and all that other stuff. You just can't afford to, to, to be that lackadaisical, laissez-faire about your body and about your health. So prevention costs more upfront and significantly less in the long run. Whereas reactive emergency medicine is extremely expensive all the time. Absolutely. So that would be, you know, just a practical reason to do it. The other reason is what are you on this planet for? Why are you here? Are you here to suffer and be sick? Are you here to do something? Why are you here? If you're just living your life worried about you know, going to work and coming home and being able to feed your kids, you're not living. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. We all have the ability to change the outcomes of our circumstances. Sometimes we need other people to do that with us. All the time we need other people to do that with us. So number one, I tell people, go stare in the mirror naked, and find everything that you could find that you love about yourself and, till, and do it until you stop seeing the flaws as flaws because none of them are, they're stories. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it, they're stories. They're not flaws, stretch marks, you know, loose skin, fat flab, whatever it is, is a story, not a flaw. Don't tell God he's flawed <laughs> because that's what you do by treating yourself the way we typically treat ourselves. So stare in a mirror naked until you yourself are good with who you are as a human being, you know, mm -hmm. and then realize that you're a human being and you have to do things in order to live. That if you're sitting on the couch watching TV 24 hours a day, you're not living. So why are you here? What is your purpose? Who do you want to be when you grow up? And then start doing the things to get there. And when you realize that you have a purpose, all of a sudden becoming healthy is part of what helps you live. It's what helps you move. It's what helps you hike and mm -hmm. run and jump and you know have sex and have fun in life. It's, you know, when, when we don't have health, we don't enjoy life. So why are you here? Why is it even, what's the point of being here if all you're going to do is suffer? Absolutely. And that's why I started working with Dr. Lyon this year. Cause I mean, I kept putting, not putting it off, but I was like, oh, I'll get to it later. And I'm like, why am I waiting? 
when mine were nothing super serious, I had resolved a lot of my problems myself by learning about functional medicine. But the last few little lingering things I was like, I cannot do on my own. Um, and very true, because most of them needed a GI map test to tell me some of those answers. <laughs> right. Yeah, you have to do with people. Collaboration is king. Mm -hmm. Collaboration in business instead of competition will mm -hmm. drive your business forward. Collaboration in activism will drive your passion forward. Collaboration in life will drive your life forward and make it more enjoyable at the you know, at the very least, you'll have people to witness your life with you, you know? Absolutely. Unfortunately for us, the people that we're watching on TV are not witnessing our lives. They're not part of us. We think they are, mm -hmm. but they're not part of us. And so when we have people hold us, hug us, love us, that's where healing begins you know, and mm -hmm. that is where healing begins in a company. It's where healing begins in a society. When we can sit and be with each other in the most uncomfortable pain, emotional, physical, whatever, when we can sit with each other in each other's pain, not have to fix anybody. Now we're beginning to get healthy as a society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're preventing disease of mind, disease of action, disease of health. Absolutely. And then as we're wrapping up, what is the most important thing you do for your health? Um, well, I do a lot of things for my health. <laughs> um, one of the things that, uh, that I do on occasion is uh, psilocybin sessions that are body work. So um, we do basically psychedelic body work, deep emotional release, because the issues are in the tissues and uh, the psychedelics have been proven over and over and over again in studies uh, to help with PTSD and trauma and drug addiction and all kinds of other things. And so doing plant medicine ceremonies in general, ayahuasca, things like that, um, are one of the ways that I self-care. Um, you know, obviously one of the things that is obvious to most people, I had a, an accident when I was a kid and my teeth were basically kicked out. My uh, whole jaw was shattered and stuff like that. So my mouth was wired shut for a year. And so I wasn't allowed to brush my teeth. And so somehow I got out of the habit of daily brushing teeth, right? Mm -hmm. It took me years to get back into the habit of daily brushing of teeth. I would do it with my finger because that was all I could do with the metal with my mouth wired shut. But self-care for me was brushing my teeth, making sure I do that twice a day, every day, you know, mm -hmm. um, making sure I take my supplements, making sure that I take long showers because for me, shower is a meditation and I literally can just sit in there lotus style and let the water wash over me. And I just imagine that it's washing away all of the day, all of the schmutz, all of the stuff that can be released, you know? So doing things like that, going in the sauna, um, you know, taking care of myself is also part of, you know, watching my self-talk and the, the things and the ways that I treat myself and questioning is, is that true? You know, that, that's a good question to ask yourself always. Is that true? Anytime you're telling yourself anything, like I'm too fat for somebody to love me. Is that true? Or is there fat people that are loved? You know, <laughs> I'm too skinny for somebody to love me. Is that true? Or are there skinny people that are loved? I'm too damaged for somebody you know, like you get, you know, all these things like, is that true? Is that true? I can't learn that information because I didn't go to school for it. Is that true? Or can you learn? Like just questioning, is this true? Is this thing I'm thinking about myself true? Most likely it's not. Mm -hmm. If it's not true, 
Where was the first time I heard it? Where was the first time I can remember feeling that way, experiencing that emotion? You know, this is self-psychology, but here's what, what goes next. Where am I feeling that in my body? And can I touch it? And can I touch the emotion when I touch that physical side of my body? Because if you could get to the emotion through touch, you can heal the somatic traumas. Mm -hmm. Issues are in the tissues. When you get injured, whether it be traumatic, emotional, or physical, where does it go? If somebody, something like shocked and surprised you, somebody died or whatever, what do you say? It's like a gut punch. Why do you say that? Because it's in your gut. It's, it lands there and it stays there. If you can't release it and express it, it stays there. Mm -hmm. When you are out of breath, you're anxious. <gasps> I'm anxious. I can't breathe. What, where does that anxiety go? It goes in your lungs. So every time what happens, you could get asthma, you could get other you know, lung issues. You know, these are all emotional ties. So we take care of, I take care of the emotional ties to the physical because I have a lot of them. So, yeah, yeah, you absolutely. Know? And then where can people find you if they want to get in touch with you? So you can find me Ari Gronich at pretty much everywhere.com. I'm on, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. Create a new tomorrow.com is uh, for the podcast. Uh, it's also on YouTube as well as any of the podcasting channels. And Achieve Health USA is more my corporate and speaking opportunity. So if anybody's interested in having me, you know, speak for their events and things like that, then that's where they would go. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.